Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl and I generally walk you through our, our show uh, every month or every week or every night if you watch it uh, really often. And today we've got a great show for you. Uh, as you know, June is Pride Month and if you didn't know that, now you do. Um, gay Pride mostly or LGBT Pride. And so I thought we should do a show about Pride, but maybe not the show that everyone expects because the question I want to ask our guests today really has to do with what did we mean when we invented this concept? Did we invent it? Did we just adopt it? Did it help us? Was it a strange thing? Do we still need it? Um, you know, just things to talk about in terms of pride and maybe something to think about as well. I have three wonderful guests today. Uh, Tori Osborne, who's been on the show many times before. <laughs> We're really happy that you're here. Tori is an author. She is uh, a senior strategic advisor to the mayor of Los Angeles, his office, Antonio Villaraigosa, as well as several foundations, national and here in California, uh, on issues of poverty and other important things to our communities. Tori, welcome. Uh, Phil Wilson, who is the CEO of the Black AIDS Institute, which is a, a think tank on issues uh, affecting AIDS in the black community, but of course, far beyond that, and one of our great thinkers. Welcome back, Phil. Thank you. And our third guest is Herb Hampshire, who has been a psychologist, who was a professor uh, for the past 25 years, has been a manager and producer in the entertainment industry. He's coming out with a new movie in September, which uh, we must all see, called, tell me again? Save Me. Save Me. Who can forget that title? <laughs> um, and perhaps most importantly these days is a board member on the board of the Point Foundation, which gives uh, educational grants to young LGBT uh, kids at risk uh, who just need help and hope. So welcome Herb. Phil, Thank let's you. start with you. Okay. Um, maybe the first time I ever heard the word pride used in a, in a context was black pride. Um, so what do you think this is all about? Did we need it? Do we need it? Uh, is it important to the gay community? Anything you want to say about it? I'm just curious at your take. Well, you know, I think to your original questions, you know, the answers could be yes, you know, but, you know, you talk about the first time you heard, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And what's interesting is as a community, you know, matures, what it means to be prideful changes. Now, and, and in fact, in the beginning you know, of you know, the LGBT movement, quite frankly, then it was really the gay movement, um, what, it was, what it was really about is not being ashamed. Now, but that's not a really good slogan. You know, <laughs> the not the shame <laughs> march or afraid. It's not a good mobilizing tool. Uh, and so, but, but that's where we were really. And, and by, by, by and large, you know, when people need to kind of claim I'm proud, usually that's an indication that they're not. You know, it's kind of okay. me thinks she protested too much. Uh, but I think that over time, what's happened, that, and often it happens, is that we said it, and we said it, and it's, we said it, and it became true. Hmm. Now, and it became much more than the fact that you know, we're not ashamed. And I think that's true in, in black communities, and that's true you know, in the LGP, LGBT community uh, as well. I think the question for us today, that for our community today, is quite frankly more complicated. Now, I think the bar has, has, has you know, gone up. Now, that it's not enough to just not be ashamed. Now, I think that you know, as we look at where we are into this new century and, and we should be really talking about and looking at our role you know, as a part of the human race, as a part of global citizens and what have you. And so when we think about what do we have to be proud of, it has to be much broader than our limited interests. You know, and I think we're starting to see that. I think more and more and more, not only are we beginning to accept our responsibility for the planet as a whole, whether we're talking about race relations or urban planning or the environment or poverty or any of those, or HIV and AIDS for that matter, then you know, we are beginning to play more critical roles in those areas and appropriately, appropriately so. So at the end of the day, I think that you now certainly as, as I think about myself, you know, and, and, the, and the different person I am at 52, for example, than the person I was at 24, the first time I went to a gay pride parade, you know, I find that it is much less about you know, how 
I react to the world from the, the narrow perspective of sexual orientation and much more of how I integrate the lessons learned as a black, gay, and in my case, HIV positive person you now and how I use that as I interact and hopefully have an impact on the larger world. Well, we still do things as a separate community in a way. We have a month, we have Black History Month and it should be so what the other 11 are you know white history month i don't you know what's that about yes <laughs> and we have uh, heroes on postage stamps uh, a series we haven't had ours yet but maybe in the gay community we will um and we have of course you know celebrations we have juneteenth we have gay pride um there must still be a reason or a positive aspect to getting together. I know when people march, uh, you know, when PFLAG marches in the gay pride parades, um, it means something to those parents and to their children. So do you, do you still see something in that that's not just about separatism, but a value in and of itself? Absolutely, I think that celebrating the human spirit, and that's the way I see you know, you know, the pride celebrations. It's more about celebrating the, the human spirit, and it manifests itself in different ways. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we are, human beings are tribal in nature. You know, and, and there's kind of this need to find, you know, my tribe, you know, and, and my tribe can be sexual orientation or race or gender or age or you no know, no health status for that for that matter. And we, we have this desperate need to, to, to find our tribe and, and to celebrate that. And I and I think that in America where so much of our history, even though we don't want to admit it or to talk about it, you now is 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 one of you no know, no other and marginalization. Now, since as a country we are a country of immigrants, now who are were escaping from a place where they were not welcome. You know, you look at you know, the Pilgrims and what have you. That's about people escaping from a place and trying to find home. And and what's so bizarre about that you now is that it seems like every time a group finds home, they become committed to making sure that the following group, you know, <laughs> is not welcome. You know? <laughs> and it's kind of an interesting paradigm. Well, you, you know, know, John Steinbeck's last book was called America and the Americans. Right. And it's not one that everybody knows very much about, but I actually think it was one of his great books. And in it, he said, you know, I'll just bet you that when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, the first guy that jumped off, you know, to tie off the rope or whatever they do, turned around and said, okay, now this is my country, the rest of you <laughs> foreigners go home. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm on board, pull up the rope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, it sounds like sort of a, you know, a balance in there. We need to be with our tribe. And there's a sort of contrarianness, I'm not sure that's a word, about the stuff that we do when we celebrate. I mean, gay pride is still a very racy event, uh, the, you know, the parades, et cetera. And we had a, a role in saying we're, we're not thinking about not only sexual orientation, but frankly, sex. That's right, that's right. The same as everybody else. Well, you know, it's funny because you now over the last few years, there, is, there appears to be an annual debate on whether or not you know, the LGBT prides are marches or should be marches or parades. You know? <laughs> and it seems that you know, there's always the, this debate where folks who are saying, well, don't mess up the parade by all of these issues. You know, AIDS is a downer. You know, <laughs> politics is a downer. You know, let's not do that. And then there are other folks who are angry because there are these folks that don't understand you know, the efforts and the struggles and that, that went on to kind of create this space. And in many ways, it's kind of both are true. You know, one of the reasons why we went through the marches, quote unquote, and the struggles and what, what, what have you, is so that there are now young LGBT people who don't experience that. That was the point. You know? <laughs> and yet we get angry because they don't appreciate you know, the struggle. You know? But the flip side of that is that while there certainly are lots of folks who don't experience that, you know, and again, whether we're talking about race or sexual orientation or gender, you know, the truth of the matter is that a lot of us still haven't arrived. 
you know, we're still having, you know, we should not forget, no matter how comfortable we get in West Hollywood or Newtown or the Village, you know, or DuPont Circle, we should not forget that, that there are kids, you know, who are in fact being thrown out of their houses every day. There are people who are being not only beat up and killed, there are people who are losing their jobs you know, every single day. People are losing their families every single day. Um, and so I think that in many ways, although it's uncomfortable to have that tension, probably that tension is absolutely appropriate because it is the way that we celebrate that we are not where we used to be uh, while acknowledging um, we are not where we need to be and understanding that it is better for all of America in this case uh, if we move forward to getting to the place where we need to be, not just LGBT people. Well, Tori, we were actually talking about that. You called it a doorway in terms of whether there was a population that needed to think of it in sort of the old way of pride and and then where you know where the rest of us so what do you think about this issue or start anywhere you want if you were thinking of somewhere else to start <laughs> uh, about this issue of pride whether we still need it whether we ever how did we express it etc I'm still trying to reconcile the seven deadly sins and pride being one of the seven deadly sins. It's my spiritual conundrum of the month. And what but, about going before a fall? Right, and then pride <laughs> goes before a fall. Exactly. But, um, well, what, actually what I said was about a gateway and I was thinking of it G-A-Y. Um, oh. There's always people coming up, just what Phil said. There's always people coming out. There's always people that need to have that um, to have that experience of walking from the isolation of the closet uh, or the rural area or the uncaring family through into that glorious communal space where you feel he, he it's a healing experience i mean because so much of our oppression traditionally has been experienced first within the family our families of origin so we've needed these healing rituals, these communal healing rituals of being together. We're such social creatures because of that, more than any other kind of, you know, oppressed minority. Um, it's the isolation of being gay, of growing up alone in a crowded family, you know, uh, that often was our first, you know, banishment from the tribe was often, whether literally or psychically, was often our first experience of our own otherness, both, you know, within, so we've had to create alternative families. We've had to create, it's why community building has been the, the infrastructural, the groundwork of our political movement has been those 10,000 organizations that we've built, whether they're centers or social clubs or, you know, my, my, my favorite example from Salt Lake City, the, the, gay, uh, the gay recovering Mormon stitch and bitch club. Um, <laughs> you know, this, we've, we've sought each other to heal the pain of that isolation of being grown up. So, so gay pride events were the most visible and largest and first kind of institutionalized annual. Um, and there's always new people coming out. And, and I think what I'm struck by when I go, uh, now is how many non-gay people there are on the sidelines, how many people are coming, having a picnic and bringing their kids down. And I guess there's a little bit of a voyeuristic, you know, it may be a little odd, but I also think this is how a lot of people learn about us and sort of make their first outreach. Well, especially to, when there's always festivals at the same time and booths you can go to, and I don't know what the kids learn, but. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. It, it does in Los Angeles anyway. I don't know if this is true in other cities, but in Los Angeles, it, this is, you know, a very big, there are many people from, from around L.A., from different cultures, uh, who are coming to kind of celebrate gay culture that day. It's become really much more than just for us. Uh, but, but still, it is the first, it's often the first um, passageway into gaydom, into identity, uh, and pride has been, and I think for any minority, you know, for any, anybody. I mean, I regret that International Women's Day is not celebrated anymore. I remember many, 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 many International Women's Day marches on March 8th, uh, and so, you know, I think that one's kind of gotten lost to history. Um, we had, you know, May Day recently, and that started out as a labor holiday, um, and it's kind of been, now it's been recast in this kind of immigrant labor holiday. But, um, so, so we need those collective rituals of 
self, you know, self-affirmation. First you accept yourself and then you can kind of show up and, and, and be yourself and other people can accept you. So, and, and constantly kids coming up and coming out. And actually I sat next to a guy at an event the other night who came out at, they're still coming out in their 40s and 50s. You know, we tend to think that just because things sort of happen in generational or cohorts or there's a, set, a developmental arc that everybody's with the, with the big cohort and it isn't true at all. People are always constantly coming out. And so I think it, it serves a very important, per I, I was thinking, you know, what would the world be like if we didn't have these gay pride parades? I mean, I take them for granted. I don't always go anymore. I don't show up every single year. I, I don't mark it on my calendar nine months ahead of time, make sure I don't take a trip and show up. You know, it used to be a must show up thing. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. And, and now sometimes I do, and, and I don't even feel guilty about it. <laughs> There's lots of other young Irish lesbians. They don't need me anymore, and that feels just fine. But I do think, I was thinking, what would the world be, what would it be like if we didn't have it? Uh, and even the, and I think it would be really sad. And, and back into the silence, the, you know, invisibility, I mean, well, we we'd still have a movement on, and know? we'd still have a centers, the centers. We still, I, I just mean that one kind of gay pride, that one sort of annual collective rite of passage and celebration. And, and you know, I just, I think it's, um, I think it's, important. Now, I, I do want to say that I do think we're in, as Phil does, I think we're in a different era. I think that identity politics, uh, that we're, we're in a sort of, I don't know, post-identity, I don't know what the right language is, but, but it's really not, not that people don't, not that coming out and identity aren't important and experiencing it and exploring it and owning it and claiming it and I'm still proud of all my little, you know, freckled and other identities and, but I, I do think that there are that there are life cycles to social movements, and there are life cycles to um, to messages and to the the kind of political. There's an arc to everything, and I do think that we're in a different time in this in this millennium and in this. I think we're at a time when what what is called on us is that we. Um, that we, you know, show up for the world and figure out what we're going to do about these out of control corporations that are ravaging the world and this global warming and this poverty uh, and we now have food shortage. Hello, we have middle class people in America who are experiencing middle class people who are, you know, not eating so their kids can have full plates, let alone what's happened in the for the bottom 40%. Well, I think that raises so. the, the, a very good issue that you had also been talking to me about, which is the question of whether we're in many ways so normalized. Um, uh, this is going to sound funny to people who are still being discriminated against, you know, at work or in Kansas or by their families or whatever, but that we're so normalized that we don't need to be proud of being gay anymore, that we're just that's part of what I am. You know how people used to say, and I just happen to be gay, I'm the mm -hmm. CEO of the Bank of America, right. and I happen to be gay. Um, and, and you were telling me about the, the New York Times, uh, not your own article, which was absolutely <laughs> fabulous, um, but the, the, the cover of the, the magazine. Two, yeah. With these two young, 20-somethings, uh, uh, white gay men, you know, in their suburban kitchen, looking just for everything, like something out of a Betty Crocker cookbook <laughs> in the 1950s. And, and you know, that, that little devil inside me wanted to say, you know, well, we'll see how long this lasts, you know. I mean, the, the women's movement came out of this. <laughs> uh, revolution happened from this kind of normal that looks like a, you know, a completely unreal. But, but it, yeah, I, I mean, that article was exploring the new normal, which a sort of monogamous marriage in the 20s for young gay men. I mean, this is, this is unthinkable five years ago, let alone 20 years ago. I don't know how normal it is, frankly, but, but, for but it's- anybody. For anybody. <laughs> Let's be clear. Like anybody in their 20s getting married is like a bad idea, but at any rate, um, <laughs> but, but, I, but I do think that things have moved so far, so fast uh, for our community. I, that it's, you know, it's even possible to posit that as one reality, you know, that, that thousands or, maybe, I don't know, hundreds of people are experiencing. And that, 
that does, um, it does change things when you, you know, when you change society, it changes and the terrain changes and suddenly you look around and it ain't what it was when you first were fighting and protesting and it's, you know, out of the, out of the suites and into the streets and then out of the streets and then into the, I don't know, kitchens. But <laughs> it was, um, I, you know, I, I actually think that we will never not need gay pride events and, and weeks and celebrations and we've expanded these rituals to other things to these days of silence now that they do mm -hmm. uh, you know t about gay and uh, school safety issues and and we've we've created um, some more perhaps even more compelling uh, more at the edge of changing things uh, rituals but I I think we're in you know I do think we're in a new world with new um, that we have to kind of borrow some of the spirit, some of the lessons, some of the tools, and I actually think that the next, you know, great coming out, the next great awakening, the, ne is the ne next great coming out is going to be kind of all the people who, um, who, you know, want like real change in this country and the world. And I keep thinking, it, it reminds me, I think about when we were so scared, when we were inside of the closet, we would sort of find each other or we would go to those bars and we were just scared because we were, we had no idea what the consequences, or we didn't know what the consequences were. We'd lose jobs, we'd lose family. I didn't go home for seven years, you know, and my family ostracized me for seven years. We've all suffered the consequences of homophobia. Uh, and. Um, but when you're inside that fear, you can't imagine, you can't, we could no more have imagined those two young gay men on the cover of that New York Times magazine. It was unimaginable. I mean, we can laugh, we can laugh about it now, but that's because it's real. And I really think we're at this, in this other, we're in this other place where we know that we have no choice but to you know, come out, I don't know what we are. What are we, progressives who want, want to change the world? I don't know, there's gonna be some discourse, mm -hmm. but we, we cannot any longer tolerate the madness that is going on. The systems are broken, the world is crazy, and I think we're gonna have, you know, you know me, I'm ever the optimist, but I think we're gonna have sort of the next uh, revolution of pride, and it's really gonna be what Phil was talking about. It's gonna be about our shared humanity. It's gonna mm -hmm. be beyond, identity while not forgetting who we are, bringing all of that to this next great uh, revolution or whatever. You know, it's interesting, my colleague in the state Senate, Daryl Steinberg, who's gonna be the president pro tem next year, <laughs> is an activist in uh, communities related to uh, autism, um, children's issues, and but primarily autism. And they have a ribbon, and it's a rainbow ribbon. <laughs> but it doesn't look exactly like our rainbow ribbon, it's a little bit more, pastel, you know, a little bit different, but I think the notion is really the same, and that is, I'm not sure, because they don't think of it as pride, and yet I think that these are also lessons people get from our community, from other communities. It's awareness first, it's kind of like, here's who I am. Mm -hmm. well, Herb, for many years you were a psychologist and a professor, and now working with, the, with gay kids at risk who just have been kicked out of their houses and now, you know, just want to go to school. Um, what do you think about this sort of this issue that we've been talking about? Need it? Don't need it? Well, it, it, we need pride. <laughs> Human beings need pride. Uh, but I, I, I have to give you a, a, a little bit of a context in terms of where I come from in relating to uh, being gay, because uh, no surprise to you who know me. Uh, I don't think of things the way uh, everybody does. I have always been convinced, I've always said that it's a blessing to be gay. I've thought that since I was very, very young. And one of the reasons is because I think that the universe created us for a reason. And the reason is to be in the world in a way that shows the rest of the world another way to be. And so it is no, it's no accident, it's a challenge that we are born into families that don't share our identity. And therefore, we are marginalized from the beginning. We, it, it's like every other minority as you grow up, you know, you come home from the outside world and, and talk about your experiences and your family says, 
don't worry about it. We've all been there, you know, but you are one of us and we love you and you're terrific and don't ever let them take that away from you. We don't have that. We have the opposite. We have what, what the kids that apply to, uh, for point scholarships have, which is when they tell their families that they are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender, they say, you're not a part of this family. You know, I always uh, often say that we're, we're born behind enemy lines, you know? <laughs> but, the, but to me, the experience of, of pride is recognizing your own value. Now, as a, I think that also you have to be uh, clear with language, whether we're talking about pride personally, psychologically, spiritually, which is the way I think of it, or socially or politically, and I think that all of those are different. Each of those is different. Mm -hmm. But it, it, in, in terms of the community sense of pride and the festivals, I think that where that came from was not so much pride, but protest. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's just like black is beautiful and black pride. It, it, it was standing up to people and saying, wait a minute, you're not going to tell me what I think of myself. Well, I think real pride comes from recognizing that you're here to show them something, not from reacting to what they're trying to show you. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, or, or the focus is on homophobia because we put the locus of power out there. We are a politically organized community because we focus on what they have that they won't give us. I have always believed that what we should be doing is, I've always said to people, you know, you have to notice that God made us with our eyes in the back of our head. And what that means is to have total vision, it requires people embracing each other so that you can tell each other what you can't see. And what we are here for, as far as I'm concerned, all of us as human beings, is to mirror back to each other. And we as a community are n here not only to mirror back to our families. As I said to my mother when she got upset when I came out, you know what, I'm never going to buy into your, your nonsense. I, I don't think I'm your failure. I think I'm your success. <laughs> and I think it behooves you to get that. But we should be, in my eyes, mirroring back to this country that this country has lost any sense of what this country is about. And I've always said when AIDS hit our community and the country and the government turned its back on us viciously, viciously and intentionally, not passively, we stood up and said, you know what, never mind. We will create an alternative world. We'll provide medical services. And, and you know, that's when gays and lesbians finally became a community because people like Tori Osborne came in and said, you guys don't know what you're doing. Move over and let, <laughs> <laughs> let us help you here. But because of that, I have always said that we saw the underbelly of this country. Mm -hmm. This country pretends to be loving and compassionate and accepting. It's not. <laughs> It is that, and it is the opposite of that. But what happened when protease inhibitors came in is that we lost that sense of community because we were built around the structures of an alternative culture that I think recreated America. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like back then, we were like the origins of this country, I think. And we were showing that to the rest of this country, to the rest of the world, which is why a lot of straight people, I think, came and said, wait, 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 I want to be a part of that. <laughs> I mean, this isn't your issue. Mm -hmm. This is the way I want to be in this country. That's the way I want to be in the world. So all of that leads to, it depends on which, which window you're looking out when you're talking well, about Part of what fine. you said, though, in terms of reflecting um, and, you know, seeing the thing that the other person can't see and saying, you know, this is what I want to show you, take it or leave it. 
there's also an aspect in us, I think, in our families, in our friendship circles, and frankly, in our country, where we feel that we need regard, however, that we need other people's validation, for better or for worse. Uh, whether it's a, a friend or a family or you know yeah. your political group. So a, a, in a way, we could say, here's what we have to give you, but I do think you have to admit there's a need as well. And I'm not sure whether pride in some of its early moments or maybe all the way through was also about see me, love me, you know, get me, okay? I want to tell you who I am, but I need you to get me. And I'm going to put up my rainbow flag on my doorstep and see if the rest of my neighbors, you know, will, will get me. But you don't do it because you hope they'll all stay away from your picnic. You do it in a way so that you hope they'll say, okay, I see who you really are and I'm coming to your house anyway. <laughs> right. But, but, but again, you, you have to remember that, that I, I have always said that, that childhood is the same as a POW camp. <laughs> uh, I do remember so you said you, that. You, <laughs> You're brainwashed as a child. You're brainwashed as a child to need their approval. You don't need their approval. I've always said that one of the best kept secrets in the world is if they're not treating you well in your house, you can crawl down to the next door neighbor and they will love to have you. <laughs> Because everybody likes little babies. <laughs> uh, but they, they, people don't want us to know that we don't need other people in the way that we, we think we do. We are brainwashed. Now, it's wonderful to have it. But the point is, when I think we stood up at Stonewall, it wasn't because we needed their approval. It was because we were saying, you know what? We don't need your approval. And what's great about the pride celebrations, and you know, that's why it's always so frustrating within this community because people are saying, oh, if only the drag queens weren't there and if only the <laughs> leather guys weren't there because that's all the media focuses on. It's like, I love the diversity. And the, and the point is we are, you know, we are sticking it in their face. That's the point. <laughs> we are telling them you people don't understand what it's like to accept yourself. You don't even understand about gender. You don't understand about roles. Uh, so of course we're poking fun at it. So but, but kind some of it, some of it is more than just acceptance. I mean, because if you kind of really look at it, you know, you know, the Stonewall riots were really about survival. We had finally reached a point that we finally got it, that they're going to kill us. I mean, just flat out, you know, they're going to kill us. And, and again, if you look at you know, other kind of experiences, you know, the one that we, we most often relate to is in, 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 the, in the black community movement, the civil rights movement. It was about people saying, you know, I have to stand up because if I don't stand up, they're going to kill me, you know. And so it, 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 is, it is a part of that, but it is a part of the, the other part of it as well. You know, my family is from, you know, a small town in the south. And I remember as a little boy you know, walking through Macomb, Mississippi, and everywhere you would go, people would use this phrase, and I've never forgotten, and I think that it's really significant when we talk about pride and, and that need, people would say, who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? You know, and basically what they're saying in our case is, in, in my case, who's your grandmother? You know, now, and, and, and as, as and my cousins and I would say, you know, that we're Eula's grandbaby. You know, that's who we, that's who we belong to, you know, mm -hmm. because that was my grandmother's name. And I think that a lot of this is about affirmation, which is actually separate from acceptance, you know. And I think that that's why, you know, a lot of kind of what Tori said is that we recreate these families because as human beings, we do have to have an affirmation because when you're born behind enemy lines, <laughs> you know, there's no one to tell you, to affirm you, no one to tell you who do you belong to. And so what happens is that we reach a point in our lives where in fact, we can find that out for ourselves. You know, and, and we go to each other and we get that inf affirmation and we discover you know, that I belong to Herb and I belong to Tori and, mm -hmm. and that's who we belong to. You know, and I think to, to that degree, you know, and every single day, there's someone who's, who's asking themselves, well, who do I belong to? You know, well, and when you look at the tragedies that happen in our communities, you know, the teen suicides or you know, what's happening when people are, 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 are falling into the addic addictions around meth, more often than not, it's about the isolation, that being overwhelmed by the isolation because they've not figured out who they belong to. Mm. But uh, it, it, mm -hmm. see, I, I think that it, it, 
I have always believed that actually everybody should create their own family. I've always said that you, you, you aren't really a grown-up and you're not really autonomous unless you have left your family, your biological family, and created your own. Now that can include your biological relatives, mm -hmm. but uh, you, I mean, I, I often notice that one of the, the uh, verses in the Bible that, that uh, Christians very seldom quote is Jesus said, if you will follow me, must, you must leave your mother and father. That's not quoted very often uh, within Christianity, but I think that, that it was a profound piece of wisdom that if you are going to find yourself, if you are going to have pride, you have to divorce yourself from all of the influences, all of the brainwashing that you have been subjected to. Because I've always said that, that coming out really doesn't have anything to do with, with saying you're, you're gay or, or uh, lesbian or bisexual or transgender. It has to do with an existential moment when you realize that all of the forces of the universe, and that's all of the forces, the family, religion, law, education, peer structure, everything, pushing you in one way, and you say, actually, no. That's not my experience. That's not my truth. Well, I think it's the oppositional, na I was thinking what you were all talking about, the question of the value of the oppositional nature of pride. That is, you can say it's about difference and other people have made us feel different. But in a way, it feels some, like we're pushing back and saying, as you've indicated, I am different from you and I'm going to value that in, in, in the light of nobody else doing it in the whole world that I know of. But you were talking, Tori, about the fear and I think that's where... Well, I, I think there's this, I don't know if it's an existential, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying and moreover, I actually think, I'm reaching for something here, so it's not completely, um, <laughs> well, I think, I think, think we're deep. all, I think we're actually in the, it may be in the world, it's certainly in this country, we're kind of reaching for these kind of moments of truth telling of just like slicing through to what you really know inside um, and and which is a which reaching for which is a kind of a courage I mean it takes courage to come out it took courage to me for me to buck my family and to to kind of just I mean, I was lucky because it was the 70s and there were, you know, lesbian feminism was sprouting and I was kind of part of, I, I was a, not alone in my creating this countercultural feminist pro-lesbian world and so I wasn't coming out all alone, but t there is an aloneness in it. It's kind of, and, and I, think, I think that this coming out about, you know, this owning of our core essential truth um, and then connecting with others. I mean, I, I think that for me, as in, this could be like a middle age thing, but mm. I have become increasingly aware of what I share with people. I have become increasingly aware of empathy for the most extraordinary set of people that I never thought I would feel empathy for. And I'm convinced, you know, whether it's kind of like the, the homeless crazy guy or whether it's the cop that I never, I always have hated cops. And working at City Hall, I learned to just like, I, I worked with a lot of cops <laughs> and I really got over my, you know, I really got to bond. And, and so what's happened to me, and I'm convinced it comes from my lesbian part, from my truth-telling part, from my having gone through the AIDS epidemic and having to face so much grief and loss from my gay divorce, you know, all the things that over time give us some wisdom and help us find ourself or find deeper parts of ourselves, or something like that. I am absolutely convinced that this core thing of, of of speaking who you are 
and standing on that ground and reaching for others um, to create something new is kind of what, you know, it's, it's revolutionary. And, and, and we need to, more of us need to do more of it. And, and whether you call it, I mean, I know this is where it feels a little retro. This is where the pride feels a little retro because there's got to be some new discourse. At some point we have to say the, the next iteration is different and the next iteration is going to look and feel different because we've been on this territory. So this is where I don't, where I don't have the answers. But for new people coming in, I know that we always are going to need gay pride. For the next revolution, I don't know what we're going to call it, but I have a feeling those <laughs> ribbons or those badges or those titum, totems are going to be a little different. But, but you are talking about exactly what I am referring to, because the reality is that growing up as a child is a lonely experience. Every child feels alone. Every child feels not understood. And I, I've always said, I, I, I have yet to meet any human being that thinks they are the right stuff. Hmm. Everybody thinks that they are a disappointment to their parents. And what you're talking about is what I'm talking about because what I'm saying is because we're gay, we have to confront it right. and then we own it. And what, what we haven't discovered yet is that we ought to be going out into the world and saying, oh, uh, just so you know, you guys, we can help you. Uh, because I, but are I, we doing that, Herb? Isn't that in no, fact? No, we're protesting no, no, against no. their power. No, which that, no but that's power. not true. I don't think that's happening anymore. I think true. that's where it started. Mm. Right. But I, I, I think that, in fact, you know, you're absolutely right that, that we all have a sense of other. And that's what people miss about who is harmed by homophobia or racism for that matter. Because when we say it's okay to marginalize anyone's other, and we know that we all have a other, some of us have a better way of hiding our other than others, <laughs> uh, that, that what happens, that the planet becomes a more hostile place for all of us. Right. And the, one of the gifts that we give to the world mm -hmm. is we give to the world the fact that, okay, you see that we're an other, mm -hmm. now, but we can survive and we can thrive and we can love and we can give. You know, and, and I think that you know, relative to HIV and AIDS, you know, that you know, the example that we gave to the world was a remarkable gift that we gave to the world. I don't mm -hmm. know that there are other communities that would have responded in as magnanimous a way as we responded mm -hmm. to this epidemic. I mean, right. the things and the institutions that, 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 we, that we created, and that's a tremendous gift. But, you know? but I don't think that we have really truly anchored our biggest gift which is why I say that, that we were created by the universe for a purpose. We are defined by the fact that we are sexual beings. Now, we are homosexuals. So, I mean, they define us. And, and, but that is our definition. Now, it escapes attention. I wish it attention. was still my reality. My reality. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of that going around. <laughs> we'll introduce you. <laughs> but the point is that it, it escapes notice, both from us and from them, that they are sexual too. And they are in absolute and utter denial. I have always said that this would be a totally different world if straight kids had to go to their parents and say, you know, I know this is going to be upsetting to you, and I know you don't want to hear this, and I know I'm going to be a disappointment to you, but I am really sexual. <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm going to have sex, and if it's a problem for you, then you're going to have to deal with it. Well, of course, that's the <laughs> other interesting thing about pride. <laughs> is that as a Martian anthropologist, I have to say, we don't care at all about these differences that all of you humans seem to take about each other. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it makes a lot of difference, seems to be what color you are, but not what color your eyes are. It seems to make a lot of difference <laughs> what sex you sleep with, but not who you work with. Yeah. You know, what are these distinctions <laughs> about? We don't get it on Mars. Yeah. And the interesting thing about our community, of course, is that in order to render yet another group of people lesser, like people we can fire, people we don't have to give as much money to, people we can put in jail, people we can kill, you know, another lesser group, Let's see, what can we think? Ah, who they sleep with. 
that's just about it. And everything <laughs> else, which of course is the reason for the rainbow, is the same as everybody else. Across the board, good, bad, tall, short, you know, whatever. It's all the same. But because they segregated us into a POW camp, in a way, we all got to know each other and found that we, we identified, it seems to me, things that we shared in addition to that. Now, maybe everybody else shares it too, but that became kind of the lessons that we had to teach because of the communal aspect, because of how we had to deal with AIDS and then HIV, uh, because of rescuing each other in order to rescue ourselves. So I, I, I never have quite figured out how we made lemonade out of lemons, which is essentially <laughs> kind of what we were called upon to do. I mean, what lesbians learned from gay men was how they were just so funny and campy and made light of virtually up. terrible situations. <laughs> exactly. You know, and what they learned from us was political, political, political. You know, <laughs> go handcuff yourself to something. <laughs> And I, that all became pride, you know. The campiness was pride. The mm -hmm. way, you know, the 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 way. What was the the um, the group of um, queer, queer activists? Queer nation. Queer nation, not queer nation. But Act up. Act up. No, with the uh, that were tutus. Oh, the radical. Oh, 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 radical the fairies. radical fairies. You know what did we learn? Harry hey, hey, for heaven's so sakes, our roots. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, it just. It's, it's funny because that's what I mean about pride. Well, it's still and, and what we bring. I mean, yeah. none of that has gone away just because the, the coherence of the community, the height of the AIDS epidemic within the gay community has dissipated a little bit. None of that has gone away. And I still see when I, now that I'm working more in non-gay worlds the last 10 years or whatever it's been, I still see that when you get an out lesbian and an out or an out gay man or let alone a critical mass of several in a workplace or in a meeting or in a company it changes and the culture changes things lighten up the you know it's and the 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 humor shifts the references shift that we do still bring a sen sensibilities and i don't think there's just one i think we are healers and i think we're artists and i think we think out of the box and i think we're funny as hell or <laughs> gay men are funnier okay it's true they're funnier than lesbians but, but lesbians are yeah, lesbians, lesbians are move more powerful, the ball right? down the road <laughs> lesbians are the best organizers on the planet totally. i'm sorry but we are we make things happen um, and you know, but we bring all of that still into the world. Now it comes, it meets up with other cultural pieces and people who have multiple part, you know, multiple cultures coming together, bring both of them. And but I do think this is still what's going on. We are recreating in the ashes, in the sort of crumbling structures of a dying order of a horrible, <laughs> militaristic, violent, insane world that has, is just, I mean, think of it. It's just what's going on in the planet. It's insane. We're destroying, the polar bears are dying and the, you know, the, the poverty is unbelievably increasing at such a rapid rate. And in the middle of that, we're creating a new world. I mean, that's what I think is really happening. And if we can keep bringing pride and um, in its multiple meanings, and if we can bring that truth telling, that absolute, refusal to be told by other people who you are. I mean, that that's the core of it, I think. That's the core of the nub of it. It's like we walked through our shadow side. You know, we we walked out of the closet into the sunlight and, and it changes, you know, it gets a little diffused and you forget a little, you don't, and it's not as pure. When I worked at the Gay and Lesbian Center, I was surrounded by gay and LGBT people all the time. It's like, my life was pure queer. It was, I, I never was around straight people. And I kind of forgot what it was like. And now I don't live in that world anymore. But I, but I bring my little dykely jokes and, you know, and, and we each do that. And we're part of creating a new world as the old but, one dies. But part of the complexity of the community also, I think, is that we are finally a, a very multi-generational community. Mm. It's like, so, it's like, I, I don't, I did literally used to schedule the gay pride. On, it was always on my calendar a year in advance. I don't do that anymore. Uh, but, you know, I don't go to the disco either. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah. well, you know, and, and, Do you still go to the disco? 
Um, I definitely don't go to the disco. <laughs> and and, and what, what's horrible is that there have been years with my travel that I have been in, in some years, as many as four or five different cities on Pride Day and not have made a Pride that year. You mm. know, um, because again, I don't schedule it. But I think that that, that is important because I think that, that the Pride that was, you know, was a Pride about saving ourselves. Uh, and I think that the pride as it will be is, will have to be either about expanding how we define ourselves you know, or saving the planet. Mm -hmm. you know, um, but at the end of the day, you know, it is about a celebration about saving. You know, yeah. um, and, I, and I think that's the transition going back to your well, I think it's question. also a threshold to politics. I mean, it has been the doorway that you were talking about for sort of young people to come into this community and find themselves has always been a doorway for so many people into other stuff. Yeah, I was thinking when you were talking about your international trips, I mean, you're called upon to go to a lot of places. And just being in other countries, and Tori, you connected with the woman from Ireland who was rewriting the entire, the lesbian who was rewriting the Constitution of you know, mm -hmm. New Ireland. And how those little parades are so frightening at first in places. To stand up in Moscow and have a parade or not frightening, you know, to be in Sydney, Australia, in the, and the entire city turns out <laughs> for gay pride. It's like, my pride, your pride, I don't <laughs> care, it's a party, you know? And, and how those vary in various nations, but how important that still is as a kind of a conduit to understanding oppression or understanding discrimination or understanding liberation. Yeah, and, and, and the, the pride celebration is, as I was saying before, also partly protest. Mm -hmm. And protest is a component of pride. It's often a, a, a pathway to pride, but it's also dynamically just like a child has to rebel against their parents. If their parents are trying to turn them into something, I've always said to parents, it is, I don't care if they're doing drugs or whatever they're doing that's negative for them, that is healthier for their soul and their psyche than for them to allow themselves to be taken over by you. You're such a radical. <laughs> <laughs> totally a true. radical. You know, not very many people value the experience of children. I was thinking about that. They're the truly oppressed class, and they're still treated so they don't know anything. They need to be controlled. They need, I mean, how many people do we know who've institutionalized their, I mean, what we their call, teenagers still? What we call homophobia and what we deal with in the Point Foundation is families literally think their children are theirs. Mm -hmm. They think, no, 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 you don't get to be that. You're mine. Mm -hmm. It's like, you want to talk about oppression? <laughs> but, but that's why gay kids have a, a, a secret because they start out from rebellion. Well, and it's even more pronounced now when you talk to transgender kids because we're having a whole new experience with kids and we don't even draw the lines the same way they do. They, they are not gay. It's not no. that. It's not about who you relate to the other person. It's about who you relate to you person, being a female or a male. And that's a very interesting difference. Um, the last show that we did was about this. And yeah, listening well, to people's experience, you know, talk about that. It's like we, the whole society isn't viewing you in the right way. Yeah, the GLB community started out teaching the culture about sexuality. The trans community is teaching us about sex, mm -hmm. about gender. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you know, as I've said to so many of, of, of the trans people, the uh, friends, you're, you're actually having the conversation that Kinsey was having in 1948, that the, the people don't understand sexuality <laughs> and we don't understand gender. Well, and how brave that is. I mean, Absolutely. that's not even got a flag yet, you know, yeah. really or a parade, although I think it was very... No, I think they're part of the parade. They are part of the parade, but I mean, that was a very, very conscious, and sometimes in the early days, difficult choice, I think. For well, no kidding. I mean, I was part of lesbian feminism where, you know, you, you no teas were allowed anywhere. 
Exactly. And there were many fights at women's music festivals over that. Exactly. I remember the women's conference in Atlanta. Oh my huge lord. A huge oh, I've <laughs> chosen to black that out. <laughs> <laughs> the National Lesbian and Conference was oh. 4,000 lesbians running in circles. And I have to circles. tell you, we are moving into the next era in the Point Foundation. We have some of our trans students that are uh, have, have problems with the fact that we sometimes call ourselves a gay and lesbian organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there are trans people that aren't gay or lesbian. Right, exactly. Because that's about <laughs> who, you, trans is about who you are, not yeah. about who you relate to, which I think is very useful because I'm a lesbian, but I haven't had a partner for 137 years, and I don't know what, it's just like if I didn't label myself, no one would know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but be clear, if you were a, a lesbian who became a man who was relating to women, then you would be a straight trans. Right, well, the <laughs> executive director of the Transgender Law Center is a female to male um, transgender, yeah. and he said he has no trouble at all now because he, you know, has a mustache and a beard, and he's a guy. Right, not a problem. No, everybody relates to him exactly. as a guy. It's not a problem. And I just thought that was so interesting because as gay people, we keep sort of going on and on and on. Right, and but again, that that go. takes you back to the issue of pride because the challenge for him is to be in the presence of people like straight people are and say, now I could hide. Mm. I don't have to let you know about my identity. But the point is that if you are, if you have pride, I think you say, oh, you just mistook me for a, a regular biological male. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, actually. And, and that's what I think we have to offer to the rest of the world. Well, but it takes, back, takes us back to what you said at the very beginning about is it really more, how do we manifest that it's more than just, I am not ashamed, which you said was not a exactly. great slogan. Right. <laughs> you know? right. So where do you think we go forward with this? I guess you've, everybody has sort of said, I don't know, you know, there's a spectrum. Some people still need it, some people don't. I'm interested in sort of in the last minutes, though we're not yet in the last minutes, but <laughs> um, about the sort of larger issues that you've all been talking about and how there's an aspect of pride in our community, in our connection with the larger issues. Well, I was thinking about when I first became politically active uh, in the early 70s, I mean in the 60s some, but found myself, my life's passion, kind of helping to build and be part of the movement, and it was called the movement in the 70s, no matter where you were in it. And we used to always say that we would always need our women's chapters or organizations. This was sort of before my lesbian feminism. I was a lesbian, but I was sort of identifying first as a feminist. Um, but we saw ourselves as, you know, a piece, a brick on the road or a piece of the larger mosaic. Um, and we connected with that mosaic, and the purpose was to build the mosaic, but we would have our tribe within that. We would have our home, I call it, you know, the, my, my home, home room in the school of life or whatever. And I think that's really what it's about. That we're, whatever, whenever, whatever year the spirit moves us to go to gay pride, uh, whatever, whatever our tribe is, if it's our friendship circle of lesbians, as I think in, in my case it is, um, or, that to me, I'm with Phil, that this next piece is the responsibility of building that broader mosaic, that broader movement, because I think, you know, it's really, uh, it, it's kind of life or death for the planet. You know, I'm, I just got the signal that we're down to our last minute, and I think I missed the five, four, three, two. <laughs> Intuitively, you knew it. Intuitively, but not enough. So I want to thank you all very, very much. Um, for being here, this is, these are my favorite shows where I have no idea what's going to happen when we all get <laughs> together and talk. And I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you uh, are proud of us for doing it. I hope that you will participate in any way that moves you uh, in any kind of pride and that you will get used to it. Mm -hmm.